Tomorrow, the Senate Intelligence Committee will hold their annual Worldwide Threats Hearing. We sat down for a bipartisan conversation with Chairs Mark Warner and Marco Rubio Thursday, just before the State of the Union Address, to discuss some of the challenges facing America today. Through the U.S. national security lens, how concerned are you about the rising risk to U.S. interests in the Middle East because of the close alliance with Israel's war in Gaza? I think it's a mistake to view October 7th simply through the lens of the Palestinian-Israeli question. I think the reason why Hamas was armed, equipped, and felt the confidence is this broader narrative, uh, this broader objective that Iran has to drive the U.S. out of the region. It is why they're conducting attacks in Iraq and Syria. They want a U.S. troop presence out of the region completely. Should so it then, stay? Huh? Do you believe that those 2,500 troops in the region should stay? I do, and the reason why I believe that is because they are not only there on a counter-ISIS mission, let's not forget that group is still existing and is still a threat, but because they sit, the reason why Iran wants us out of there is that our, we are stationed at key points that tie Damascus, uh, and, and, and Baghdad and, and, and all these supply routes that Iran wants to dominate. If we were gone, these proxy groups would now be at the border of Jordan, be able to threaten Jordan and ultimately threaten Israel as a result. But I am concerned. I mean, whether it's Hezbollah and, and uh, up in the north of Israel, whether it's what's happening in Gaza, whether it's what's happening with Yemen, the, the risk of, uh, of conflict is very real. It's a dangerous and tenuous situation. There's no doubt about it. President Biden is reviewing whether to keep those troops in Iraq. Yeah, in and I'll be numbers. anxious to see what he says. I do think, though. Do you think they should stay? I think in terms of the current basis, yes. President Biden uh, wants to establish a port in Gaza to try to bring humanitarian aid in. It's not exactly clear the cost, the U.S. military role. Um, do you think that is a good decision? The United States has been the largest single donor to humanitarian efforts for years in the region. And I think it is important that we continue to show that. I mean, the airlift approach is more symbolic than actually getting relief to most folks. I think the right thing to do in terms of, particularly as we go into Ramadan, hopefully lowering some of the tension, but also shows America's concern um, for some of the humanitarian costs in the region. I would just add one thing to this, and that is uh, it's important to understand why everybody's in favor of helping innocent civilians who are caught in the crossfire of any conflict, I think it's important to understand the reason why aid can't get to them. Hamas has built this system of tunnels. It's expensive. I mean, I don't care if they got a great deal on the concrete. It's expensive to build this extensive system of tunnels. Millions of dollars. That's money that could have gone to create an economy, to feed people, to build hospitals and, and serve civilians. They didn't do it. And there's real concern and I think very legitimate reason to believe that any aid that goes in there will be grabbed by Hamas, used for their purposes, at the expense of the civilian population. Hamas has a track record of zero when it comes to caring about the lives of civilians or of, of society in general. You know that the U.S. Ambassador, David Satterfield, who's handling that, has said uh, in written letters to Congress that they have no evidence that Hamas is stealing the aid, certainly not defending um, Hamas at all, but saying that aid can continue to be pushed into Gaza without Hamas stealing well, it. The I'll just respond personally. I don't know what he's groups. talking about because how does Hamas get food? Hamas does not have an economy. Hamas does, Hamas, everything Hamas gets comes from abroad, from Iranians and from what they take. I think that the evidence is in place that they have existed as an organization without any means of generating revenue other than what they are able to capture from sure, others. That's but just in common terms sense. Of now, yeah. with I, the aid getting I in I think now. The, the food and water and other relief aid, I think it is, you, you've got to make sure you have a distribution system. Um, but I think uh, I agree with Ambassador Satterfield. But let's also step back for a moment. And this tunnel network, which is close to 500 kilometers, I don't think we, any of us fully expected that. And they have been able to secure that. Um, the fact that we are 140 days roughly into this invasion, I think most of us, even in the region, thought the Israeli Defense Fund, uh, Defense Forces would be able to take out Hamas 140 days in. They basically taken out only about 35% of the Hamas fighters and literally have only penetrated less than a third of the tunnel network. We brought in some of our experts and to say that if, if this was us trying to take out this tunnel network, could we do it quicker, more efficiently? And candidly, the answer was maybe we could be a bit faster, but when Hamas is gruesomely mm -hmm. holding the hostages uh, to prevent some of the taking out of the tunnels. This is one of the lessons. This and I think the lesson of drones in, in Ukraine are two of the things in terms of military doctrine I think that we're going to have to learn from both of these conflicts. When Benjamin Netanyahu, the prime minister, says total victory is within reach weeks away, 
you are not describing total victory within I, I have not. You're saying the impact's meeting tiny. With, meeting with folks in Israel, in the military community, in the intelligence community, the idea that you're going to eliminate every Hamas fighter, I don't think is a realistic goal. Mm -hmm. And you agree with that? Well, I think that it is possible to achieve a situation in which Hamas does not have the capability to do what they did on October 7th. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean Hezbollah doesn't step in and take over now as a result. That doesn't mean that a new Hamas offshoot wouldn't be created. This is an ongoing challenge. And at the end, the head of this entire snake is the Iranian regime. They are the ones that provide the weaponry and the funds. There's no Hamas fighters starving to death. There's no Hamas leaders starving to death. They're all fed. They all have medical care. And they all have uh, all the assistance they need to continue to do the things they do. And we'll be back in one minute with more of our conversation. Stay with us. We asked the senators what the greatest national security threat facing our country is, and there was quite a list. But in terms of the long-term challenge, both agreed it's China. Last year, you told me technology competition with China is the issue of our time. How far ahead is, is the U.S. versus China in AI? One of the things that Senator Rubio and I have done on a bipartisan basis is try to go industry by industry in America and warn them of the potential theft of intellectual property, $500 billion a year, the fact that China is investing in quantum computing, in bio, a lot of our time spending on, on bioengineering and activities China's taking. I think we need to compete against that. On AI, it's a little bit, I, I believe, a little bit of a better story. You know, a couple years back when we thought uh, the country that had the most data and the most compute and the most engineers might purely win, um, that's not proven to be the case. The vast majority of innovation is still taking place in this country. If you look at all of the major AI companies, they're virtually all American. Uh, I don't underestimate China, but we have that innovative economy uh, that, that frankly still benefits with us. And frankly, the Chinese regime is reluctant to allow these large language models to be used by their population because Frankly, they might find the truth about what the regime has done all the way back to Tiananmen Square in 1989. There are reports that China lags the U.S. by about a year. Is that consistent with what I, you I don't know agree? how to characterize the time frame, but I would say that's not really the issue per se. First of all, I, we're clearly, I think, ahead simply because they steal our stuff. We're not interested in stealing their stuff. So there's a reason why they want our stuff, because it's better. I think the bigger concern is how it would be utilized. China's ramping up its military spending. Absolutely. Um, Senator Rubio, you recently voted against the National Security Supplemental that would have sent $5 billion to the Indo-Pacific and to help Taiwan. Why do you think that money can wait? Well, I don't think it should wait. I just don't think it should be held hostage on the issue of whether or not we're going to deal with our border. You are saying that the aid to Taiwan is being held hostage to the border, but you are saying the border needs to be handled first. If we would have done a bill that would have voted for the money to Taiwan and the Indo-Pacific and money to Israel, I would have voted for that. But they want Ukraine in exchange for the border, and, and the same way they're holding Israel funding hostage. They won't do Israel funding without Ukraine. And I support helping Ukraine. But I believe that our national security begins in our own country, at our border, where today you have thousands of people a day walking into the country, many of whom we do not know who they are. That has to be a priority. And How I'm do you insisted. get aid to deal with Taiwan now? Well, let's vote for it. Let's put up a bill that votes on Taiwan. You're saying it has to be a standalone. No, it doesn't have dollar. to be. I mean, if the president tonight at the State of the Union, I know we're taping this, and he announces that uh, he's going to re put back in place the policies that allowed us to detain single adults uh, until the removal proceedings were done, I'll vote for that. I'll that vote for that. It requires a lot of funding. You know that. It you doesn't would be require for... a lot of funding. That's the existing law of the country. Border security says it needs more funding, as does well, ICE. Let's do the, the funding for that. But, but it starts with the executive order, which is what applies our laws, which he refuses to do because it would require him to admit that Pre Trump was right about the border. So, because I'm sure Mark agrees with everything I just said. Well, listen, I, just think this. <laughs> I think I you're gritting your teeth this. through I that. I would just say this. Yeah. The border's a mess. Yeah. There are certain things that the president can the do. President the president says the border's not secure. But let's go back to what President Trump said. President Trump said, change the law so I can do more. Mm -hmm. I respectfully believe that what Senator Lankford put forward was as tough a border deal as could get passed in this Congress and even next Congress, because unless there is a 80-member you know, shift one way or the other in either political party. I think you know, politics is the art of the possible. I think it was a good deal, and I, I, I agree with Marco. We need to get the money uh, to China and Taiwan. We need to get the, the money both humanitarian and for Israel, but I think the issue 
that I have been is most wrapped around is if we walk away from the people of Ukraine at this point, after in the last two years, the Ukrainians, with our help and the Europeans' help, at literally the cost of less than 3% of our defense budget, have eliminated 87% of the Russian pre-invasion ground forces, 63% of our tanks, 32% of our armored personnel carriers. If we don't stand by Ukraine right now, the rest of the world should never trust us again. And this notion that these authoritarian nations are watching each other, if people say she is a threat, and if they don't believe that if President Putin is successful in Ukraine, and that will then put NATO and American troops in harm's way, she will take lessons from that, I think there is enormous linkage. If we don't stand by that commitment, uh, then I think this will be a, a mistake of, uh, as historic as some of the mistakes made in advance of World War II. How do you respond to that? We have 7.2 million people in this country that have entered over the last three years. Some of them, we don't really know who they are. New York just deployed National Guard troops to the street because of a migrant crime wave. But I mean, we have a serious problem here at home. And so I think that we have to go to Americans and say, okay, first and foremost, our priority is going to be to deal with our issues here. And all I'm asking is that be made a priority equal to So if what President we're doing Biden tomorrow world. said, oh, uh, I'm going to put in an emergency action to, you know, he's already said essentially he might. mimic remain in Mexico, you'd say, fine, here's $60 billion for Ukraine? Sure, that's what I said. That's what I've said from the very beginning. We have a migrant wave that began in mid-January of 2021 because people calculated that if they got here, they were going to be able to stay, and 85 to 90 percent of them were right. right. And it's drawing more people to come here. It's unsustainable. I think most Americans, and in fact, polling backs this up, believe that there is an issue that needs to be dealt with in the border. But you are linking them right now. Sure, you are. Just, and no different than the people that are linking Israel aid to Ukraine. Because okay, they won't vote for a standalone Israel bill. They want, unless we do Ukraine. And I'm saying I won't do Ukraine unless we secure America's border. You, uh, Senator, helped to spearhead an effort with Senator Kane on a bipartisan basis to prevent any president from unilaterally withdrawing from NATO. Yes. Did you write that with Donald Trump in mind? Because he's the only president that I can recall who has ever threatened no, to I wrote withdraw it. from NATO. I wrote it. I, you know, I, I can't speak for Senator Kane. I wrote it with the belief that it's an important alliance. If NATO didn't exist, we'd have to create it. It's one of our strategic uh, uh, strengths that we have in the world because China doesn't have these alliances, for example, and neither do the Russians for that matter, or the Iranians for that matter. But I, and, so, and I believe Congress needs to play a role in deciding whether we're gonna remove ourselves from that. That said, I will tell you that despite what people may say is rhetoric, because I, I acknowledge that Donald Trump does not talk like a member of the Council of Foreign Relations on these issues, he actually increased troop levels in Poland, and I saw them. I was there when that happened. He was trying to draw down from Germany and rotate into in Poland. Poland. President Biden reversed that. And so the, the point being is that I don't believe Donald Trump will remove us from NATO. I do think he is going to do, admittedly in an unorthodox way, what virtually every American president has done since the onset of NATO, and that is demand that some NATO countries do more. We'll continue our conversation in a moment, so stay with us. Welcome back to Face the Nation. We continue our conversation with Senate Intelligence Committee Chairman Mark Warner and Vice Chair Marco Rubio. If I could. Um, I'm the, against it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> You're consistent we, in that. We have but different... the Biden campaign joined TikTok, and, and I Senator said, Warner. And I said that sent a pretty darn mixed message <laughs> because the Biden administration supported my earlier bipartisan legislation that we would lead to a path of potentially banning TikTok because I believe that TikTok, both controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, both collects data and as a news source, literally half of young people in America get a lot of their news all from TikTok. 170 million Americans And the are idea, on it. if you don't think the Chinese Communist Party can twist that algorithm to make it the news that they see reflective of their views, then I don't think you appreciate the nature of the threat. Would the United States ever allow um, China to buy CBS? I don't think they would. And we, we might have slightly different ways on how we go at this, but we think this is a national security issue. The danger in TikTok is not that somebody goes on that video and you know, puts something up that looks stupid or silly. The reason why TikTok is so attractive, its value is it has an algorithm, a recommender engine, which is one of the best in the world. That is owned by ByteDance. Under Chinese law, ByteDance must own it. And the only way that that recommender engine works is if they have access to the data. So it doesn't matter who you sell TikTok to, where they're headquartered, it doesn't even matter where they store the data. The as long as ByteDance engineers in China have access to that data, uh, control the algorithm, they have to have access to American data to make it work. 
And that's what we need to confront. That's the reality here. And, and you like this house bill? Listen, I think, there is, I think there's a lot of creativity on TikTok. And I think if they had to disgorge, as long as the algorithm moved, if this was a Brazilian company or a French company or a Canadian company, it wouldn't cause me near the consternation. I don't know about the I haven't read it in detail yet. It's not an easy thing to resolve, but ultimately what we have to focus on is who owns the algorithm because whoever owns the algorithm will have, will have access to the data. And manipulating that data. algorithm right. can mean what kind of information you're going to see. And if you don't think that could be used as a, the most powerful um, propaganda tool ever, then I don't think you in appreciate it. In an election that. year. In an election year, then you don't get the threat. You, Senator Warner, said last month that we are less prepared for foreign interference in 2024 than we were in 2020. What exactly are you well, concerned we about? We have nation states, China, Iran, Russia, who know that interfering in our elections is both effective and cheap. We have a lot more Americans who have, for a variety of reasons, less trust in any of our institutions, including our voting system. We have a, a court case that was in the Fifth Circuit that had restricted the voluntary communication between social media and the FBI or CISA. And you have that cauldron of change going on. And then you throw in artificial intelligence tools that can bring deep fakes or voices or other manipulation at a speed and scale that's unprecedented. It's the area of malign influence, right? What are the issues that already divide Americans? So let's amplify messages that put them at each other's throat that makes their politics even more conflictive. We already do a pretty good job of it on our own. Help us do that. And that doesn't just deal with elections. We're beyond just election interference mm -hmm. with malign influence. It's now an effort to influence our policy debates, to divide us year round right. on a regular basis. Russia does it and they've done it for a long time. The Chinese want to get into this business. The Iranians and others will join them because, and not just here, we've already seen examples of it in other democratic nations. It, it's a growing risk and I think one of the first things we have to do is talk about it so people understand what it is we're trying to describe. It's not hacking ballot boxes. It's hacking the minds and our political debate in this country by exacerbating pre-existing tensions to the point of boiling over. And it's not clear how people are supposed to protect themselves against what you just described. Well, aware, it begins with awareness and the understanding that sometimes these messages that are being driven or some of these things that people are putting up online are not real or they are a video of something that happened halfway around the world 10 years ago, not down the street one month ago. Uh, but there are things that are designed to get people angry. And, and you know, the algorithms feed this because people love content that shows something outrageous and more people will view it, so it's easy to push this. And before you know it, people are out there voting and at each other's throat over something that may not even be real. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest risk for election night? It's a huge risk. And now, we got a job to do and I hope others will advance this as well. 20 tech companies said in an agreement in Munich that they would try to put watermarking and that would indicate if content has been altered or, or deep fake. Is that uh, they, sufficient? They've said they will take it down. But it's all voluntary, so we need to keep the pressure on. And frankly, uh, I think the administration needs to lean in more. Uh, and I think we need to do a, a better job. I think people were potentially more aware, even four years ago under President Trump, do a better job of educating that with these new tools like deep fakes, you know, don't believe everything you see and hear. Our full conversation with the senators is on our website and our YouTube channel. We turn now to the House Democratic leader, Hakeem Jeffries, who joins us from Brooklyn, New York. Welcome back. Good morning. Great to be with you. Uh, leader Jeffries, you know, our latest CBS polling shows Donald Trump with a four-point lead over Joe Biden. And Mr. Biden has not consolidated his base Democratic voters, specifically among black voters. Biden is ahead of Trump, 76 to 23. But that core Democratic group that he won with about 90 percent back in 2020 is showing just it seems like a lack of enthusiasm. How does President Biden fix it? Well, the polling has been all over the place, but I'm confident that at the end of the day in November, the overwhelming majority of African-Americans, Caribbean-Americans, black voters throughout the country will support President Biden, understand that he has delivered over and over and over again on issues of concern, whether that's the lowest rate of black unemployment in decades, whether that's historic investment in historically black colleges and universities, making sure that he has been supportive, incredibly so, of small business creation and entrepreneurship in the black community, mm -hmm. building upon uh, the efforts that had been previously done uh, by President Barack Obama. And Joe Biden has a vision for the future of an inclusive economy 
uh, that grows the middle class and ensures things like home ownership within the African American community can continue to grow. Well, we heard a bit of that vision in the State of the Union address, but we don't often hear from the president on many of these things. Al Sharpton was just quoted in the Washington Post saying the campaign needs to do more to draw comparisons between, quote, two old white guys. He said they need to spend more money on ads, more money touting the record you just laid out. Is, is that it? What is it that is making people not have this enthusiasm? Well, I travel throughout the country and spend time, of course, in the district that I represent here in Brooklyn. And there is a high degree of enthusiasm for President Joe Biden, and it is growing. Uh, President Joe Biden had an incredible State of the Union address. He was strong, he was serious, and he was substantive, and he drew a clear contrast between his vision of moving America forward in an enlightened way that's inclusive of everyone and the contrast with the extreme MAGA Republicans who want to turn back the clock, turn back the clock on reproductive freedom, turn back the clock on voting rights, turn back the clock by ending Social Security and Medicare as we know it. President they Joe Biden is on the right side of those issues, on the right side of those issues for the American people. On the issue of the border, um, our polling shows by more than five to one, voters say Biden's policies will increase the number of migrants attempting to cross versus Trump policies. That's an impression. I know in the state of New York, you recently had a race uh, in uh, New York three, the victory of Tom Swazi, and he campaigned on tougher border positions. Specifically, he said he was comfortable describing this as an invasion. I wonder if you endorse that language, and if you would encourage Democrats to adopt it. Tom Swazi ran a great campaign. He communicated with voters. He talked about common sense solutions to meeting the challenges that are facing the American people. Now, we believe as Democrats that we have a broken immigration system and that we need to address the clear challenges at the border. Uh, President Biden has repeatedly made that clear entered into negotiations with Republicans who decided to detonate their own border policy bill because they were ordered to do so by Donald Trump, who's more interested in playing political games than solving the challenges at the border. Tom Swazi leaned in to the fact that he supported the bipartisan bill that was being negotiated in the Senate, right. and that Republicans are the ones who walked away from it. That is what was decisive in that campaign. It wasn't just process. He used that word, invasion. He used much stronger language. Do Democrats need to uh, campaign in a, with a stronger message specifically on immigration, and you know the, the flow of migrants is only expected to pick up in the coming months. This isn't going away as a campaign issue. Invasion is not a word that I would ever use. I'm not sure whether he used that word or not or in what context. I do know what Tom Swansea said is that he believes that we are a nation of immigrants. Of course, through his own experience, his grandfather coming over from Italy. At the same period of time, we need to also deal with the challenges that we confront at the border, anchored in the notion that we also are a nation based on the rule of law. And we can and should do both. Okay, dreamers are not in the Senate bill. And as you know, uh, the Speaker in, in the House has said it would be dead on arrival, even if it were to pass the Senate. So um, moving to another issue that seems also stuck in Congress right now, aid to Ukraine. It runs out, ammunition does, in the month of April, according to the Ukrainian government. You want to get the $95 billion package, I know, from the Senate through the House. There's no date to do that. Speaker Johnson has not committed to do that. Do you need an alternative? And can you promise Joe Biden, who made this issue number one in the State of the Union, that you can deliver on it? Of course we don't need an alternative when you have a comprehensive bipartisan national security bill that has come over from the Senate and all we need is an up or down vote in the House of Representatives and everyone in Washington knows that it will secure at least 300 votes if not more so we can meet the needs of America's national security but there's no date to do that our democratic allies in Ukraine and Israel 
uh, humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians who are in harm's way, support our allies in the Indo-Pacific. That's a question for Mike Johnson when he knows that the House has the votes to act on America's national security interests. The reason why it's not happening is because there's a pro-Putin faction in the Republican Party led by Donald Trump and Tucker Carlson who are blocking this legislation, and that's shameful. Will you protect Speaker Johnson from a motion to vacate if he takes that vote? Will you prevent him from being ousted? We haven't had that conversation as a caucus, but I have made the observation that I believe there are a reasonable number of members, if the Speaker were to do the right thing, that don't believe that he should fall as a result of it. That sounds like a yes. All right, Leader, thank you for your time this morning. And Face the Nation, we'll be right back. And we're joined now by the vice chairman of IBM, Gary Cohn, who also served as former President Trump's top economic advisor in the White House. Welcome back. Great to be here. I want to talk to you about a few things with the economy, but also what President Biden took aim at in terms of taxes, because you were the architect of this tax policy. Um, tax rates for most Americans could go up as soon as December of 2025, uh, because that's just an expiration date, uh, unless Congress acts. Secretary Yellen said if Biden wins re-election, he'll seek tax cut extensions only for people earning less than $400,000 a year. What do you think of that plan? So, Margaret, let me explain. So when we redid taxes in 2017, the personal side of the tax code expires December 31st of 2025. So as of January 1st, 2026, we revert back to the very complicated tax code that we had in 2017. Mm -hmm. So people have to remember that. It was extremely complicated. You bring in all these things as personal deductions, itemized deductions. Now you bring in, 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 in salt deductions. We raise tax State rates. Local right. We raise tax rates, but you bring in all the loopholes that we got rid of. So what we tried to do when we rewrote taxes is we tried to simplify it and we tried to get rid of all the loopholes that basically the wealthy people in America use. Mm -hmm. And that was a way that we tried to, to make the tax code fair. And the data shows that we've made the tax code fair. If you actually look at who pays taxes in this country, the bottom 50% of earners in the United States pay 2.3% of tax collected and the top 10% pays over 70% of tax collected in this country. That is, that sounds like the exact opposite of what President Biden described in the State of the Union, because he took aim at billionaires. He said they pay a lower tax rate than teachers. He proposed minimum taxes of 25% on billionaires. How do you respond to that? Well, I, again, I think you've got to take one little step back here. A billionaire is a measure of net worth. It's not a description of their taxable income. Mm -hmm. You could be a billionaire and have no taxable income. You could not have a billion dollars and have a high taxable income. So when you look at the way because people it could are- could be, you're just sitting on assets. You're just sitting on assets. And you could be sitting on illiquid assets. You could be sitting on liquid assets. We do a very good job in this country of taxing income. That's what the Constitution talks about. The Constitution talks about taxing your income. Mm -hmm. There is no income in this country unless you buy a tax-free bond that doesn't get taxed at a minimum of 20%, whether it's interest or dividends or capital gains. So there's no billionaire in this country that has income that is not paying at least 20%. But the president is tapping into at least a perception that wealthy people have um, far more of an advantage and that corporations are taking advantage of the little guy. I mean, he went down to the 10% fewer Snickers in the bag mm -hmm. analogy he in did. his speech, basically saying you're getting ripped off. So uh, what do you make of, of that idea though and, and the explanation he's trying to make for why people are experiencing inflation even though the rate is coming down? Well, let's, let's talk about inflation for a minute because I think it's a really important concept for everyone to understand. Inflation has a compounding effect, meaning as you look at inflation year over year, you're adding up those numbers. You're not starting at a zero every year. So if we had 6% inflation last year, 7% inflation, and now we have 4% inflation, 
That's 10% inflation. So if you take a basket of groceries at the beginning of 2020, just a simple yeah. basic basket that cost $100, it costs well over $125 today because those 4% one year and 7% one year and 7% the next year, they add up, they're cumulative. So there's a huge cumulative effect inflation. So when people are being told, consumers, you're wrong, inflation said, no, they're right. They're completely <laughs> it is right. Actually they're completely expensive. right. And what they're more right about is we at least finally have gotten to the position where wage growth is faster than inflation. But we had not been there till the last few months. So yeah. people were losing purchasing power, and that's why people were angry. And then take on top of that the high interest rate environment, where if you thought you might have been in a position to buy a house because you save money, you go out to get a mortgage at 7 or 8%, you can't afford a house. Mm -hmm. So people got very frustrated because the cost of their everyday lives got very expensive, and the cost of investing in their future by buying a home got nearly impossible. So President, or the former President Trump is campaigning, talking a lot about uh, the frustration consumers have. And I want to ask you specifically about this idea he's floating of tariffs. He's said uh, tariffs as much as 60 percent on, on China. Last night, he outlined these plans. If China or any other country makes us pay a tariff or tax, let's say 100 or 200 percent, we will make them pay a reciprocal tariff of 100 to 200 percent right back. It's called you screw us and we screw you and everybody's happy. You've said on this program in the past, Trump's tariffs in the last administration hurt consumers. Will this hurt consumers? So remember what a tariff is. A tariff is a tax that the importer pays at the border of the United States that tariff then gets passed on to consumers here in the United States. It is a consumption tax. Mm -hmm. Now look, I want to refine that a little bit. If we manufacture those products in the United States and we're using a tariff to protect our manufacturers because China can produce cheaper, because they don't pay fair wages, they don't have health care, they don't have to have a return on capital, I'm okay with the president or, or the president nominee or whoever it is putting a tariff on. But if we're putting tariffs on things that we do not manufacture in this country, and everyday citizens need to consume those products, that is highly inflationary, and it will really have a dramatic impact on our economy. So when he's talked about tariffs on Mexico, tariffs on other countries, you're saying that's going to cost consumers more at the end of the day. So if you're buying something, if you're buying a baby stroller or baby formula, and it costs X today, and it's now X plus 60 percent right. at the border, you are paying that as the consumer. No one's absorbing those tariffs except for the ultimate consumer. And, and if you have to buy those goods, you're going to have an inflationary impact on the economy. So uh, in terms of what you are thinking as someone from the business community going into this election, there's the presumption that business community will be with Trump. Do you have any misgivings about him and his plans, given what he has done, including bringing autocrats to Mar-a-Lago, as he did with Viktor Orban this week? Look, I think the business community at this point is still open-minded. I think the business community really wants to hear the policies. You know, there's a lot of big policies out here. We, we touched on taxes. Yeah. You know, what's going to happen in taxes by the end of, uh, end of 25? Where are we going to be? That's very important. Energy policy, yeah. very important to business. Business consumes a lot of energy. We haven't even talked on AI. AI is a huge consumer of electricity. It's going to change our demand profile mm -hmm. dramatically in this country. The southern border, what's going to go on at the southern border? Legal, okay. legal immigration. We need skilled laborers yeah. in this country. We need to bring in two million skilled laborers in this country. The business community is going to look at those topics, and they're going to look at the platforms of the candidates, and I think that's going to have a huge impact on how they vote. You're saying it's still open. You would be open to voting for either Joe Biden or Donald Trump at this point? I think based on those policies, that's going to influence the corporate community because those are the factors that really impact how they can run their businesses. Look, I can throw regulation on there, the ability to, to, to merge, the ability to consolidate, the ability to buy back stock. All of those things really have dramatic impact on the corporate community and how they look at the campaigns. So President Biden in his State of the Union said, Wall Street didn't build America, unions built America. But he ad-libbed but they're not bad guys. So you're not a bad guy, Gary, according to Joe I, Biden. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> but, I mean, in, in the rhetoric alone, does there need to be outreach? Or you're saying it's actually going to come down to, to the dollars and cents of it? No, there, there, has to, there has to be outreach. There has to be outreach. The, 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 the current administration 
is an administration that is standing in the way of business and business growing and business trying to grow jobs. Mm -hmm. Your know, business wants to invest capital in this country. One of the other things we did in the 2017 tax plan is we made companies repatriate their offshore earnings. Companies want to reinvest that capital in the United States, but they want to make sure they can reinvest it in a sound way that will give their shareholders a return. When they invest the capital, it creates jobs, but they want to make sure the regulatory environment makes sense for them to invest capital. Gary Cohn, thank you for coming in. We have to leave it there. Thank you for having me. We'll be back in a moment. That's it for us today. Thank you for watching. Until next week, for Face the Nation, I'm Margaret Brennan.